uh, planning board meeting for order for October 9th, 2012. Is there anybody here to come to the public to speak on, on matters that are not on our agenda? Okay. Any corrections or additions to the agenda? I have a motion to uh, accept the agenda as make a motion we accept the agenda as presented. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Everybody have a chance to read the minutes from our, our last meeting. Do you need any corrections or What's up? Any corrections or uh, changes to the minutes from the last meeting? Can we just vote on that? No, we voted that to accept the agenda. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, I don't have any changes. I don't have any changes. I'll make a motion we accept the minutes as presented. Second. I'll second. Harry? Second. Yeah, I'll second. All in favor of accepting this uh, the minutes from the last aye. meeting? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, we have one A and R from I was pulled from the last meeting. Okay. Do I come up? Sure. I'm sorry. I don't remember your name. Name's Bill Gruber. Bill Gruber. This is all I'm talking about. This house is going to start right here. And right now, the line goes through almost half of the side yard that it's going to be. I own all these properties here. So we're just moving this line over here. And this parcel is going with this house. And the remainder of this land is going with this house. Well, that's Thank 
Are there, any, are there any administrative items, Jessica? Um, no, just a reminder that there's the CPTC trainings and we're willing to pay. So if you want to sign up, let me know. And I have I'll some paperwork, paperwork for you. Okay. Uh, new business. Uh, East Hampton Savings Bank's request uh, for release of the performance bonds. Uh, Mr. Gracia responded with... Uh, yes, I forwarded you a letter today. Yeah. He saw no issues. Anybody that didn't get a chance to download his letter? No, I got it. No, I never saw it. Yeah, I see it. <coughs> Mr. Gracia recommends releasing both, saying that the uh, requirements have been met. Um, is there any, any more discussion? No. <laughs> Entertain a motion to uh, grant the request that the East Hampton Savings Bank performance bonds be released. So I'll make a motion. No, second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. So, question. I'm Mark Reed from Heritage Surveys representing East Hampton Savings Bank. So, will we, we get a letter from you or minutes or how do we? I have to figure out what's been done in the past. That's the first one I've had to do. So, let me see okay. what the standard procedure Research has that. been in the past and then we'll get you the proper Paperwork, certification, whatever. certification, whatever needs to be right. done. Whether it's just a minutes or... Um, I'm assuming it would probably be a letter. So a letter, I think it was like letter. sending just a paragraph. I think, yeah, letter. I think it would be a letter from the board <coughs> saying that it's released. Yeah, if I remember right, that's what it was. Just a letter stating that... The Signed off by the planning board. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. We'll get, okay. We'll get that done. Uh, that's good, thank you. Sure. Good night. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Hi, Mark. Good luck. Good luck. I like these. <laughs> Sorry, I had skipped dinner. <laughs> no, no, no. I never skipped dinner. You can tell. And that's a real no. Thank you. Representative from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, uh, give us a presentation. That's me. Um, we got a couple of handouts for you. I'm Chris Curtis, um, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. I met a couple of you, but some of you have not. So I'm here to talk about really two things, the green development performance standards and transfer of development rights briefly. Um, yeah, thank God. Uh, these are bylaws that, should I come up and get you? Yeah, sure. sure. These are both bylaws. Does everybody want to just come up here and sit at the table instead of being so far back? You're welcome to. Do you have an extra one of those being? Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I'll, 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 okay. I'll get closer. I don't want to get <laughs> Nobody here I don't, I don't want to face the camera. <laughs> <laughs> camera shy this time. I'm not camera shy. <laughs> you can't be. <laughs> So these are bylaws that we worked out um, over the uh, year 2010-11 with Stewart and the previous planning board. Um, you know, if there's a new makeup to the board, we'll have to kind of restart this process. But just as a kind of a quick background, we met last fall, last time, um, last meeting we had was in November of 2011 um, on these bylaws. At that point, I presented um, both of them to the planning board, and uh, they gave preliminary approval to the language. We sort of finalized most of the language, and, and in the case of TDR, the map. Um, we, at that point, said we would have a final meeting in December to vote for the planning board to vote, and then to take them to the ordinance subcommittee in January. So obviously, we've fallen a year off the, yeah. off the schedule yeah. on, on that process. Um, but we did kind of go through the bylaws. There were some comments on them, and I would address those comments, and I'll kind of point out as I go through them uh, what we changed or updated. So what I thought I'd do is, with your approval, just go through and summarize some of the key provisions, give you kind of an explanation of how the bylaw is supposed to work. Please interrupt me and ask questions if you have any. Um, so sound like it makes sense? Yep. Great. Okay. So the main purpose of green development performance standards is, is to protect natural resources in the development process. So by natural resources, we're talking about woodlands, farmlands, water resources. Um, we're hoping to try to reduce site disturbance and minimize clearing in the development process uh, to conserve water and energy, 
promote recycling and use of uh, renewable energy, reduce car use, um, reduce pollution, and um, incentivize green practices in building design. Um, and so there's a process for implementing these which is in the applicability section and there are really three parts to this uh, depending on the type of use. So for residential uses, um, single and two family residential uses um, have a short list of standards that are a prerequisite to a building permit. Um, and there's no public hearing required, it's just planning department review. Um, to um, promote compliance with those with those standards for commercial and industrial uses and also multifamily residential uses the, the bar gets set a little bit higher and there's a site plan approval process so there's more detailed standards um, there's planning board review in this case uh, there's a public meeting and then there's a decision that that you as a board make to either approve or approve with conditions um, the um, compliance with, with the green development standards. And then lastly, the third one is uh, residential subdivisions. There's just a, um, a separate list of standards that um, is an add-on and supplement to the subdivision regulations. Um, so that would be part of your, your subdivision review process. The standards themselves are divided up into um, a series of topics or categories and they start on page eight. Um, provide, and I want to kind of just take you through each one of those, um, at least hit the high points. So limits to site disturbance. Um, looking at 10.861. Uh, here we're trying to preserve the natural topography and drainage as part of the development process, uh, minimize land clearing, and maintain uh, wildlife habitat to the extent possible. Uh, the next section on tree preservation, um, with uh, standards here are trying to uh, preserve large specimen trees, maximize the retention of uh, large tree stands, and use best management practices to protect trees during the construction process. Then we have a section on solar design, and um, really this is about simply trying to get buildings to be sited um, and lots for that matter in the case of subdivisions to face south so they can maximize the, um, the use of solar passive solar gain. Um, then we get into a set of standards on site and context assessment and what these are saying is basically that the design should consider um, the natural and man-made features of the site um, they should consider access to municipal facilities, to bicycle and pedestrian and transit facilities, and also um, the availability of infrastructure. Sort of common sense stuff in many cases, but um, I think it helps to, to put it into, into standards. Then there's a section on landscaping and water uh, reduction. And the standards here are um, intended to try to minimize uh, the size of lawns, minimize um, the use of potable water for irrigation, potable water, and to use uh, what we refer to as low impact development standards, um, such as um, rain gardens or rain barrels, things like that, to, to capture rainwater and uh, reuse it on site. The next section is on farmland protection. Um, these standards are uh, attempting to minimize the loss of farmland um, as part of the development process by using, um, encouraging the use of uh, clustering uh, and protecting any adjacent farmland next to a, um, a, a development uh, by things like using uh, buffers and fencing to, to protect uh, 
active agricultural use. Then there is a section on parking and trip reduction. This section is um, looking at standards for reserving parking for things like compact vehicles, low emission vehicles, or uh, carpooling or van uh, pooling in, in terms of, um, again, parking standards. Um, it also provides some standards for trip reduction and um, reduced uh, use of, of uh, on-site driving. So in other words, um, trying to get, once you get to a, a larger development site, um, reducing the amount of driving inside the site. There are some standards for pedestrian and bicycle access, and these are um, established to encourage the provision of sidewalks, um, uh, amenities for bicyclists like bike racks, and links to bicycle paths, existing bike paths, such as the uh, Manhattan Rail Trail, if there was a, if there was accessibility to that. Then we have some standards for handling of hazardous materials and storage. Um, so these are basically best management practices to um, promote um, safe storage and, and prevent spills. We have a section on light pollution reduction. These standards are to uh, reduce glare and uh, light pollution um, onto adjoining properties. Are these all part of the dark sky standards? Yeah. Then we have some standards on collection and storage of recyclables. And this is really just requiring um, some on-site areas to be provided for storage and collection of recyclable materials. And it has, has um, specific tables identifying the size of those areas for different types of uses. Um, construction waste management and topsoil recovery. Um, these are standards that um, uh, are looking for the recycling or salvaging of 50% of the non-hazardous construction and demolition um, debris from a, a site. Um, and also the um, preservation and reapplying of any topsoil that is removed from the site. And then the last of the, the standards are, is the heat, heat island reduction standards, which are calling for the use of light colored roofs and roofing um, materials and also the provision of uh, shade where possible on the site uh, to reduce the kind of buildup of uh, uh, solar related heat um, in urban environments. So those are the standards that um, would apply to different types of uses. And then there are also, at the end of the uh, bylaw, a set of incentivized green performance standards, which are uh, <coughs> optional and available to applicants that want to take advantage of these. And um, in return for meeting these incentivized standards, they get certain um, benefit benefits. So that the things that can be optionally done would be the addition of the um, green roof to a building, uh, the installation of permeable pavement, uh, adding additional open space protection above and beyond what is already required, or a public park, uh, or the restoration and protection of wildlife habitat. So if a uh, developer chose to um, add any of those items to their um, project plans, they would be eligible for certain incentives, which would, uh, they're summarized in, in the table, but they're basically including um, additional lot coverage, reduced parking, increased building height, or reduced frontage. 
and those are sort of translated in numerical standards uh, again in, in the table. I don't quite understand why we want to do that. But <coughs> if, if, our, if our height standard and furniture standards are reasonably set already, why would we want to incentivize those? Get on about that well, I guess the discussion that we had the last time was that um, there was a feeling that there was enough um, flexibility in the standards that we could allow some increases or reductions without um, damaging the intent of the bylaw in order to get something that was really important to the community as, as a in, in return. So you're giving something, you're taking away something. Um, but um, yeah, I I agree with I agree with Ron on, on that one, and I, but I do agree that some incentives are appropriate, but specifically setbacks and height. Uh, if a person were to take advantage of, for instance, both the setback uh, and the height restriction, the building would cast a much larger shadow for any to any adjacent buildings. I mean, as far as so we're talking about solar access in one part of the um, uh, of this ordinance. Uh, and building orientation to maximize solar gain past the solar features of the structure. The person across the street from you happens to have um, a bit more money to spend on some of these things and then I also, as long as I'm bringing it up, I, I kind of take exception to the uh, locating parking for fuel efficient vehicles and you know really um, desirable spots within a within a space because it to me if a person can't afford a fuel efficient a fuel efficient vehicle they're further marginalized by even parking farther away from their front door for instance it just seems to create a, a, an element of classism that I don't really uh, care for personally and you know building height limitations I think are and setbacks are, are established for a lot of reasons, one of which is solar access. I, I, uh, I just not only natural light for, you know, landscaping and right. things like that, but so I wouldn't want to see that change as in it. I think if we have leeway in our setbacks and, and height restrictions, they should be changed for everybody, not just for somebody that can afford to, to buy into it. I don't see setbacks on here. Am I missing that? I see uh, the frontage and I see the height. Frontage, I, I misspoke that. If it's frontage and height. Okay. height but anyway, it, it, and I don't want to get hung up on... on I oh, I see. But I mean, yeah, we don't want to. I'm not like trying to attack it either. I don't want you to feel like that. <laughs> but I, I, I just it's a, just a question of my kind of. Then that would put uh, certain people in a certain class. Now you're starting classes of people. Well, but there are people that are willing to give us something else. So if you're trying to preserve open space and green standards and things like that, that's people what I'm are willing to invest the money in that, which right. that's the dis discussion is whether we're. That's something we prefer rather than the extra five feet in the building height. Right. Or whether they have a fuel efficient car or that. But they should be closer or further away. But our frontage and our building heights should be set by by very stringent building standards that are, are important to the dip to each zone and and not something that's for sale to, to somebody that can right. afford to, to amend it. It, it. I just think that's really I don't think it's necessary. I mean, I think so they're the buying it by giving the town something else. So I don't think that like the height and the frontage stuff is necessarily at the bare minimum for safety. I think it's at the amount that we generally want to have throughout town. But to have exceptions for people that are going to dedicate money and property to help the community as a whole. That if there's wiggle room within those safety standards to still have a safe building that's going to be, I mean, you, you give up one of these things, you get an extra five feet in your building, you can do that up to two times, it looks like. So, I mean, in exchange for what they're giving, you know, a green roof, a permeal pavement, preserving open space, you're, you're adding what I would think is a pretty negligible difference in the height of a building for something like that. But, I mean, I, I guess that, that is the question is whether we're willing to 
I have wiggle room on that to to get more of these green standards in place. I think we should look at it more globally as opposed to individually. So so and so has a hybrid vehicle so they get to park closer to the coffee shop. I think it's more that as a community we're trying to encourage people who are in a position maybe to afford that vehicle to buy that instead of an Escalade and on a community-wide standard that helps out all of us. I mean, that would sort of be my logic to it. I see in the individual, individual case, it, it would appear to be the person who well, could buy. When I, we were going over that little bit about the parking and proximity to the building, I was thinking, uh, who, who's going to buy a fuel-efficient vehicle because they get a closer parking spot to the coffee shop. You know? Well, yeah, I, mean, I don't think it's actually going to encourage somebody to make that purchase, but I think it sets a, a tone for the community that this is something that we're encouraging. How would that affect your parking spaces? So if some, say some business has to have 10 spaces, well, under 10 spaces, you're going to have at least have one handicap. So we're going to take a note and take it off the list because you have a, a vehicle that's going to go in with 29 miles and a gallon of gas and a woman in another spot. I mean, how would you do that? Well, I think these are considerations that you would look at with each of the applications. So if it's something that's got six spots, you probably wouldn't require them to, to do that. But maybe if you're putting in a big Y or something like that, you might look at it and say, yeah, okay. okay, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't, none of these are, or none of those things I think are required. They're considerations and tools that we can use. So I would, I would imagine something like that in the vast majority of cases would not be a requirement for our site plan, but that might just be me. Now, there are some places that when you go in, such as big uh, uh, marts and things like that, they also have, you, they have compact car parking. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a designated for compact cars. Or people with children by the, right. by the uh, and shopping it's, you know, Those are designated spots, and it's not saying I'm better than you or anything else. It's just that it's easier parking for a compact car than a big Escalade. And that's the reason why those things are designated. So I don't see anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a little different though, because it's not that only you know a low emission vehicle or something could park in these spots. Right. I mean, it's actually an incentive for those people, basically. But but I mean, I, I, I don't I don't think the parking spots is a particular big yeah I don't think deal big argument. About that. Yeah. How did the last planning board deal with? Um, Enforcement items and then where's the onus? Well, that's the thing. Where's the onus? <laughs> yeah, we, we spoke about this. The planning yeah. board was pretty bare bones at the time because it was in November of last year and, we, right. and, and Chris was here to talk to us about this. That was my first introduction to this stuff. Uh, and I know that we, we're doing pretty much what we're doing now, just going over what's here. And just like now, some of us had some knee jerk reaction to certain things in there. Well, it's a process. We gotta have to get a little yeah. more familiar with this. And, 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 and I know one of the things I see incorporated now is that the expression uh, "to the extent possible." Uh, right. And right. that, to me, is kind of a uh, can of worms because to the extent possible. Well, you know, we put people on the moon, right? So that mm -hmm. you know, what what is not possible to do if you really have a desire to do so? Who gets to make that call? Is it the planning board through discussion? Then it's, it's quite a bit of very, it's, it's a, a lot, lot of subjectivity power. here, yeah. A lot of power for a planning um, board to. Exactly, and if a person who is, uh, seems to be, have plenty of money available to spend on a project, uh, well the standard could change if somebody is before the planning board who seems to not have so much money, but we can't be, you know, so money makes well, a lot of things happen, it makes a lot of things possible. So when we start deciding to the extent possible, except for what things cost, but everything, that's the song going to be tied. My yeah. guess is it's all going to end up being what are people willing to do. And that, exactly. that, that these are sort of guidelines that people are going to look at. And I mean, if there aren't, I, mean, I, I think the problem is that the teeth we have can be very big or very small and that you can sort of let things go and just say, oh, we discussed this and gave it lip service. Or you can say, we're not letting you do this project unless you do X, Y, and Z, and that may make it incredibly expensive. Harry wants, uh, wants this. Uh, I'm just curious how, how this is going to affect uh, our Route 10 committee. But I'll let uh, John uh, we'll talk to that. 
it's good to have all the proposals. I word that well, not myself, but the committee's drawing up that they're going to propose. So it's a, probably another month. How is that going to apply to all this? Well, this isn't adopted yet, so. Well, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, eventually, I imagine it'll, it'll be. This would get layered on top of. It was, well, 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 uh, that doesn't even include the uh, master plan and the committee, what they're going to put there. Right. On top of that. Yeah, so. You're going to have by three entities. You got the, the highway business, you got the uh, master plan, and then you got the planning board. And all this, I'll have to, because the Route 10 and this and the master plan, when this all comes together, which one gets priority? Pri yeah, yeah. Who, which one gets priority? Do we do the do we do this first, and then that throws a curve into the Route 10 business, and it also adds more initiative towards the master plan committee. So it's a it's a three pronged uh, attack, <laughs> and how do we? separate what's first and what's last. Probably a four prong because hopefully we're going to be looking at some well, yeah. uh, revamping of zoning. Right. And I mean, we got that's something zoning. to think about is that, you know, if if we're able to, to move forward on that and say the next year and moving forward with the with the zoning overhaul, if we're able to get funding, um, then you know we can take all of these components and as part of it as part of it as part of and say you know as part of this process we're going to find a way to integrate all of these different things together so that they work and that there isn't confusion with overlay of different standards that are the same things but in different sections which is where we're starting to head towards so the part about this that i think would work that i actually like is the incentive incentivizing uh all of these to the extent possible, <laughs> but I mean, we, so much of what's happened already uh, in green building and in, in, in green development is all in, in solarizing is all through incentives, you know, the tax incentives. Are, and you know, what Jesse said about well, the incentives, you know, to do the right thing and, um, instead of having a a bunch of standards that say to the extent possible, which I, I see problematic, is incentivize, find out what the goals are, and create an incentive for all of them. Like, for instance, the being able to, uh, I have a problem with building heights increasing or, or setbacks decreasing, but I don't have a problem with, uh, for instance, allowing uh, a building to cover more of a lot. Uh, you know, as an incentive to do some of the other things. Like if, uh, and, and some of it makes, some of it's kind of logical, like the, uh, um, what is it, the, the uh, heat island, you know, the, well, if you put on a, a green roof uh, and you use uh, gravel instead of asphalt, you know, things like this to reduce the amount of heat sink there, uh, on your building, then your building could be larger, right? Because you wouldn't, especially where as it pertains to a roof, because now you're you've minimized part of the impact of the roof. This is the same concept as solarizing. You use less energy. You know, you take uh, less from the grid. So, actually, you know, people that do that, and they they build a bigger house because then they say my utility bill will be the same. You know. House, but I mean, the point is, so, so it all kind of is logical in that way that those kinds of incentives, um, um, incentivizing this, might be a better approach than having a board try to determine that somebody is actually meeting these requirements to the extent feasible. I, I, <laughs> or maybe there's another way to word it. But I know we talked about that a year ago too. Well, that's, almost, you I know, was going to say that's that where was that, one of the main that language came from. Exactly. Was the last meeting we had. But the stuff that's in um, bold italics and in mm -hmm. terms of font, um, yeah. the maximum extent practicable is the language that we mm -hmm. um, that the board suggested a year ago. Um, and I think we changed the. Uh, the terminology for the site plan approval to simple site plan approval at the board's request because they, you know, they wanted to see that that type of language. Um, I, I support uh, a good portion of this, mm -hmm. but I, I think we're at a, at a 
a juncture here between things that are going on within our community and, and some changes in the planning department and changes with the planning board that I, I don't think that it would be wise to, to go full uh, steam ahead with this at, uh, at this time because there are just too many conflicting layers of, of zoning here that we're going to pile on, I think. Um, personally, I would like to see us wait until late spring or early summer next year to see where where we are with those other other items and, and then pursue more of this. Do you think that the Room 10, room 10 and possibly the zoning will be done? I don't think the zoning will be done. I don't think the zoning will be done. I still need but, to find money to do it. Right. We're still not <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if the idea uh, is to hold off on this, so the like route ten would be the route ten ne definitely will come first because we know that the master plan committee it, it will be an ongoing thing so that it's not as worryable as getting the route ten and then coming back to this and then if you can get the money then going into zoning, but. If we get the, I don't know, if we get the fun, funding, I would like to see this just assimilated <coughs> into the rezoning rather than. Yeah, that could, I have that some could concerns be. With, with just the permitting process of this because, right. as you know, I've been pretty clear that I'm trying to simplify permitting as, as much as possible. Right. Um, and I mean, just the first thing that under the simple site plan approval, it says all single family and two family residential shall, re shall receive planning board approval. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say whether that is new construction or whether that's somebody coming to put a porch on. And right. so, I mean, I just in that first section, I have concerns that the planning, if it ends up being the planning department and not the planning board, we're going to be burdened with every single building permit that comes through this building we're going to have a review process on. So that's a lot more foot traffic for us. So I think it's important for us, we've talked about administrative site plan review and whether this is somehow could be incorporated in that sort of function or whether it's something that's left up to just to Joe. I mean, I think there's a lot of questions here about just even that first thing and whether, um, you know, single family homeowners coming in and having to, to spend money to do higher engineering plans that they might not normally do under a traditional building permit process. I think these are just big questions we need to talk about. I think that's a big concern. Is that a lot of this is a lot more complicated for an applicant than in the existing process, and, and it's a big thing to ask people to do. Um, I think in some of the smaller residential things that I, mean, I think for a bigger development, there's no question that it's easy to ask somebody to, to meet that burden, but that it's pretty big. But, but there are some elements of it that are quite <coughs> quite easy to pull off. That Absolutely, agree. I, agree. I, think, I think, but just we need to tailor the requirements so that it's not such a huge burden that they need to spend $500 in engineering plans to, to meet the standards, but they can still hit the requirements doing maybe a more low-cost sort of... No, I understand. You know what but, I mean? But, th but there are certain elements that that would have a big payback like building orientation mm -hmm. you know right now I mean that what that doesn't take any engineering especially in a development if you're going to lay out a development you know typically they're laid out on kind of a grid without any any consideration of what side the sun comes up on it goes right. down on. I mean it seems pretty easy to lay it out differently so houses still front the street parallel and all that stuff right and we can do that during the subdivision Design. Exactly. I think that, that makes absolute sense. It's just the single family, it's the one guy coming in who, again, unclear whether it's if they're adding an addition to their house, whether right. they would need to meet these or not. And so, I mean, we're just, we're, we're now in the process of trying to deal with the non-conforming structures and trying to make it easier for them. Do we want to add another layer of complication for the single homeowner who wants to come in and put an addition on? And if it's for new construction, <coughs> then, you know, maybe that's a different discussion, but. Well, and I'm still unclear, so, I mean, under this, I mean, if somebody comes in, even if they're building one house, and we say, boy, you know, this should really be oriented different in the lot, and they say they don't want to, I mean, are we telling them they can't, they can't build it? You know, I mean, I don't, I guess I don't understand entirely how, yeah, how much we're digging our heels in over this. I mean, well, and, and an idea that I had that David was talking about, the, to the extent feasible, was maybe we could do some sort of point system. 
which might, you know, here are all the options that you could do. Here's all the things that you could do. If you do this thing, you get two points. If you do this thing, you get three points. You know, if you are a single family or two family residential, you need to meet 14 out of the possible 62 points and then you're fine. So that gives you some sort of standard for mm -hmm. for us for review, but it sort of, I think, maybe deals with that to extent feasible because then it allows the person to sort of pick and choose what is to the extent that's feasible exactly for them. Right. Do you know what yeah, I mean? That's a good idea. So that might be an option to, to think about. Is yeah, they can scope it system. to their needs. Not We're going to tell them this is what you have to do. Right. And, and it drives the design of a structure. Right? Yeah. What comes to mind is working in San Diego uh, along the coast. A lot of people wanted to, any, any work that took place, new or added on, they wanted to take advantage of the view of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And so there, in order to, one of the incentives was um, if you have, um, uh, use materials uh, like concrete floors, you know, thick uh, masonry floors and things like that that would store heat through a window uh, where the sun is coming through. Well, you do en enough of this, you get more windows. So people would always want, well, there was the one that was used an awful lot, right? Because they'd uh, add windows and then do passive solar features in the house. Right. And that's 25 years ago. Well, I'm talking about telling people what they have to do. I just think we should figure out, I mean, we do that all the time. We just need to figure out which of these are things that we're comfortable saying, you have to do this to get a building permit, and which are the things where we're going to strongly encourage it or incentivize or do something like that. Well, okay. Jess, I, I, want, I want to counter to something, you just just the concept of, uh, earlier you were talking about the building heights, and what, but that's good for the city. What if somebody wants to do that, it's good for the city. I would take a different view of that if I lived next door to a place that was getting taller because they want to do it but now you're taking a position of what if people don't want to do these things should we tell them that they should do them well no, that's what I'm saying is I'm saying I think we need to decide what are things that we're comfortable telling people they need to do and what aren't I mean I think all these things it, I mean anytime you're going to have exceptions through incentives there's going to be individual cases where it's not going to be in 100% of the people's best interest the point is deciding which of these benefits are community-wide things that we would rather encourage for the good of the whole, even if that means that one person is next to a house that's five feet taller than their neighbor's house was or something. So, I mean, I think that's, I just think we need to figure out how far we're willing to go on which of these things. Yeah, I, I also think as a, as a community, it, 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 I mean, this is still, you know, if we're going to acknowledge property rights, we, we don't want to go too far with it either. And I, I like the idea of a point system that gives people an a la carte. You can buy into this or you don't have to if you don't want to, but you know, if you if you want to be part of it. Yeah, because I you know, when Jess was saying we were we're not really going to tell these people what they can or cannot do. We're going to give them advice on the point system. This is what you can do. And this is how you can get around not saying you have to do this and then we're the planning board. We're giving you incentives to do things and not telling you you have to do it this way. You got it. But, so would there be any, but would there be any <laughs> things at all, just like uh, anything at all in here that would be a change that everybody would have to abide by? I mean, similar to like putting seat belts in a car. They didn't right. say you, you can or cannot put seat belts in your car because it's really the best thing for everybody. As we move forward and, and energy becomes more expensive and more, uh, well, less abundant, you know, we're running out, we're, we're peak oil. Some of these things should be done for the good of not just East Hampton or, you know, but for everybody. So are there any things here that people should have to do? It's not an incentive or a point system, but, you know, mm -hmm. if we adopt these things. Well, just kind of like the stretch code, you we've, know? Yeah, we've, say we've, already, we've already put in the stretch code, and that's, that's to try and help with, with more efficient mm -hmm. buildings. And, and so... And that's mandatory. That's <coughs> and that, that was that. mandatory. Yeah. But yeah, we have a lot of permits out there now that we're just extending. For like for trees, years. for instance. Can if somebody wants to like go in and do a development and just moonscape the place, just completely just remove absolutely everything because it makes yeah. it easier for people to move heavy equipment around, is that okay or should you say at some point if a tree is larger than this, 
Well, I think that's yeah, addressable yeah. there, anyways. Yeah. On and, that. and don't forget, we have a stormwater ordinance that right. limits the stormwater over an acre, is and also has thresholds um, between, I think, it's four thousand square feet, mm -hmm. ten thousand square feet. It's in the general ordinance, so that is also applicable. So somebody at this point couldn't come in and just strip it totally clear cut without going through the stormwater permitting process okay. first. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, just so you know, right. there's another permitting level. <laughs> but I think when we were, you know, designing this, we tried to put the the uh, standards in for things where there was really a choice between what you would, which option you would choose in developing mm -hmm. a piece of there are options. Yeah. And then the incentives are things that would actually cost a, a proponent additional money to do. So if it's going to cost you more money to put a green roof on the building, you ought to get something in return for that. If it's going to cost you more money to, you know, to set aside some of your land for park space or open space, then then you should get something back for that. But um, you know, on the other side of the coin, there's you know, this, we talk about the solar access, for example. That that doesn't really cost anything to to change the orientation of, of a building, to um, preserve trees on a site, and and to you know perhaps locate your building so that those specimen trees are really important trees aren't destroyed and, and you just move shift your building to accommodate that that's not really you know necessarily costing you anything mm -hmm. so that's kind of the, the the overall standard that we were kind of thinking about mm -hmm. when, when we put these into the two different categories um, so lots of good comments um, and I've been trying to take notes on all of them um, I think that uh, there are a lot of issues here that need further discussion and I guess I would just say that you know our intention is, is to try to to work out an ordinance that you're happy with that's going to be you know something that's workable and, and you can and you can make work for the community um, there's nothing set in stone here all of it is is open for discussion and, and change process-wise, I guess I would ask maybe for a little guidance on um, would you want me to, going forward, to try to address some of these issues to work with Jessica, or do you want to work on this as a full group? Um, I don't know what the other members uh, see appropriate here. I, I voiced my, my opinion. I, I think we should hold off on this for, for a period of uh, of months at least until probably spring um, just because I want to let some of these other things fall and we have other things on our, our uh, list of things to do that that I think should get done um, before this but the one thing I would I think when he was asking do we want him to go just to Jessica and revise this or come back to the board as a whole. I feel it should come back to the board. My, well, my, definitely come back. But my, my point is is I don't want to see work done if we don't know what direction we're going in. Right. That, that, that's why I'm not encouraging continuing to, to work on it at, at this point. If if we go in one path we're gonna we're gonna use this. If if we find out the next six months that we can get funding and we're going to go for a larger zoning uh, re, uh, rework then then yeah, this, will, this will be well maybe utilized. we'll get benefit from it though I mean, even if it's not adopted in its entirety I, mean, I think it might still give us some useful stuff that we could put into whether it's a fixing the zoning or things to add whenever we're doing the highway business district I don't know Nail down some of the language. And I'm just thinking of how long it takes us to get anything done. Do you want to actually right. do it next spring? Do you want to come back, back in the spring and then we're really going to be done with it, you know, the following spring? But I, I don't know. I just think, I mean, if people want to start working and paring down some of the obvious things to this where we could get uh, a, a better outline or framework. Um, I'm fine with that too. Right? We, we may really see in the process how some of the some of the um, concepts already fit into some of the things that exist. Right. Like Jessica Bob to start. Well, it could make it more, more comfortable for us too. Well, I also think that once we have it set, David was saying I think he's right. There's I think there's a lot of stuff in here that's easy things that we can all get on board with and can right. put into a workable process, but. Um, and I think there may be some harder issues that are more complex and maybe more controversial, but if we work on it a little more, maybe we can figure out what those things are and, and put them in somehow. Okay, well, I don't know. Let's just go around the table. How do you see us proceeding? 
<laughs> well, we do have a lot of things generally happening, but, but we did at our last meeting decide to avoid getting into some other new thing because we were working on this. So I think if we're working on it, we should be working on it. We should consider it. We should, um, how do we proceed from here? Uh, everybody has this now. Um, uh, if, as Jess said, you know, there probably are things in here that seem pretty straightforward, pretty easy to get on board with, at least uh, talk about those things. Um, you know, make a list of five items on here that, that we feel that, you know, we each like somehow. Maybe get lucky and see if a couple of you, we all share the same idea. idea. Yeah. 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 Talk you, about those, something. You know, do you want to put it on the agenda and spend a half hour a meeting or 50, 20 minutes a meeting or some time thing and, and work on it? I think you could probably put it on an agenda and put it down near the end. But I mean, we'll spend, mm -hmm. we'll spend, spend time, some time every, every, day, every meeting and chip away at this. Yeah. I think it may be worth spending time to see if it's worth it to spend more time. Right. I think that we might be able to tell that this is going to be too much to handle right now, or we may be able to see that there's stuff that we well, let's let Chris go back and with his notes that he's taken and revise whatever has to be done, and then our next meeting or the meeting after when he, we can have him back and get a revise on this and then go straight forward with it from there. Or we can just leave it the way it is and... I would suggest well, leaving it as it is right now. So yeah, and, and, and just go through this. And, and have us work off this before yeah. Chris do anything else. Yeah, okay. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll get Jessica to, to come back to you in, in several meeting sequences if we make progress on, on specific things. And, and I'd like to you know, say that we should try and, and maybe work through this in sections and, and yeah, break it down. So the process is you guys are going to work alone, and then when you're ready to have Chris come back, we'll contact you. Right, yeah, yeah, I think that would be a good yep. idea. And then that way, and, and even if we send some of our process or our progress to Chris and, and we work back and forth. Okay, that's um, fine. But um, my concern is, is, is having you utilize time and, and not go in, in a direction that's going to be useful eventually so yeah. that I don't want to yeah. see you spin your wheels. Yeah, I, I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be, uh, be you know, frugal with, with sure. the resources and not... not so that, that would be a good idea that we would just work, work on it as a board and then go forward from there. Yeah, well, one, one other option I'd just offer you if, if you think this would be at all useful is I'd be happy to, to have you all mark up your copies and write on them you know what you like or don't like about it or any comments that you have and, and send those over to me and I can try to assimilate all of your comments into one draft that sort of reflects what you're collectively saying and you'd have something from from there to work off of. That gets, that, gets, that gets pretty hairy or, before or the five other option versions. is I could I could keep a marked up draft while they comment and when yeah. they come to agreement on something I can mark it up and then I'll send that to you Chris so yeah. you have one that might be a better idea okay. yeah. or Harry Harry <laughs> or Harry I think we should wait for our rule 10 findings we can we can have an orbital layout how that overlays on top of this mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that are going to be on rule 10 that are that are, that are not on here or that are on here. Mm -hmm. So you can compare them both and then go from that point. But to start breaking all this down, you're going to have a lot of, have a lot of stuff that are from root 10 is going to be the same thing. Which I think in the long run it might be good because you have two documents saying that the same thing needs to happen yeah. there. So and you just actually adaptive. have right. more momentum maybe right. to move forward. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff in here that, that is, it's not going to be on root 10. Correct. Not even close. Correct. But there's a lot of stuff that's really good in here. So Jeff, you're saying that when the root 10 comes down to to the planning board stage that we can incorporate what's happening in with this into Route 10. So f technically we'll be working basically on both. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and again, this is sort of the overlay issue is that right. a lot of these standards could either replace our current commercial development standards section. They could be either duplicate or supplement the environmental performance standards section of the ordinance. Um, and so the highway business section is in that commercial development performance standard. So right. we would need to think about sort of big picture, if we don't have a zoning overhaul and we do want to implement this, are we 
taking those sections out so there's no conflict and confusion? Is this sort of going to be the replacement section for those sections coming out? Or are they going to stay the same and there's just going to be some sections deleted? Or, you know, mm -hmm. again, it's sort of more so comprehensive could, thought process. We could technically so. work on both. I just went know from, from 10 on one side section yes. 10 that it gets very unwieldy very fast and I'm still not happy with you know there are mm -hmm. things in that that I wish were different so it's um, it, we're, we're talking about a much bigger more comprehensive uh, scope here that that's well, really a good challenge for us <laughs> well or maybe what we do is that we're going to limit that scope well, no, I, I, we'll, we'll go through this at, at, at piecemeal here, and, and but I'm, I'm just saying that the big picture that we're looking at with the, with the Route 10 and, and, and everything else, our, our zoning is kind of in flux right now, and we're, we're, we're looking at layering things, and, and it's getting more cumbersome as, as we go here, and, and, and if the idea is to make our, our zoning more streamlined and, and easier for people to interpret and, and more e even and level-handed for everybody using it, then we've got to be careful not to make it more complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm wondering just how uh, you'd be in a better position to know if we incorporate this and of course we'll get the Route 10 to come down sooner or later. Uh, how long do you think it will take to get the money or to get the road? <laughs> well, what I'm saying is it could take us quite a few months and we'll say we'll go into 10, 12, whatever months and then all of a sudden it comes up that you've got the money and we're now going to do a big zoning change. So all that time it won't be wasted because a lot of it will be incorporated into the new zoning. Well, right. and my idea is that if I'm able to get the funding, if it all, if the stars align and moonshine, oh, yeah, it all, yeah. all comes together, oh, yeah, um, then we can take all of these different reports. We can take what the highway business has submitted. We can take, you know, whatever we form here. We can take what's coming out of the master plan committee. I think there's some good sections of our ordinance. I wouldn't throw the whole thing out. I think oh, there's no. some really good right. things in here too. I think there's just some confusion and some inconsistencies and some poor definitions and it just needs to be cleaned up. And so, um, you know, if we can take all of these things and hand them to a consultant and say, you look at all this stuff and you right. figure out the best way to make all of this stuff fit together yeah, without right, yeah. confusing all of us and making sure that we're interpreting correctly, then that's how I foresee that zoning process yeah. happening, is that we're taking all these elements, we hand it off to somebody and we make them sort of right. organize it and make it. Clean it all up. Correct. This, this, so you're saying that we should probably still go, just do our thing I with this and wait to see what happens and not worry about it. And that if it doesn't it happen, happens. then we have something we can move right. forward on. And the work that we're going to do with this is going to define what we want right. the zoning to end up being eventually. Mm -hmm. if, if we Correct. Yeah, come that'll be the same design. with Route 10. So. Yeah. All right. All right. So we're going to work on this stuff. We'll start yeah. hammering it out. We'll yeah, start hammering it out. Okay. okay. So the idea. We'll put it on the schedule again to make uh, time on every agenda from this point forward mm -hmm. to go into yeah, this spend some time, time at our meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a good idea. And then we can, like you said, we can make notes, individual notes, as to what we feel can be changed or the definitions in that and then bring them in and then we can go over it in, individually. You know, what do you find wrong with it or right with it? And maybe we can get it and crash it in sooner. Okay, so everybody's in agreement? Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. So now we'll be scheduled in. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you for sure. Jessica will get a hold of you. Good. Right. Good. Now, I'd ask Jess if I could just spend just a few minutes talking about transfer of development rights. Is that okay with you? Oh, yeah, I have that. Sure. Okay. So that was the other piece that we had been working on last year. Um, brought copies of that. Um, with Stuart, you have an existing transfer of development rights ordinance, so this was... The map is behind you. Yes. Oh. I brought an extra copy that I want to pass these out. To date, my understanding is to date, nobody has Correct. used it. <laughs> right. Right. That was kind of the issue. That was, that's the reason for attempting to try to revise this to make it more workable, more usable. Yeah. Yeah. 
So this yeah. is this date is very interesting to match it up. <laughs> this dates back to February. I had brought them with me knowing that you were here because I was going to ask you about it. Yeah. Well, there's a long history, so <laughs> we've got the evidence of it right there. So I think this is a lot simpler than what we were just talking about because it's an existing ordinance and um, really just trying to amend it in a fairly minimal way to make it more workable and, and address a couple of issues. So if, if I could, I'll just take a couple minutes to quickly describe what, what's here. Um, we've added a couple of new purposes, um, which include um, protecting the Manhattan River and Mount Tom. Uh, in the first section, we have uh, expanded the list of entities that can hold conservation restrictions, which is on the second page. Um, we've expanded uh, that list and clarified that list to make sure it, uh, it's clear. So it includes the Conservation Commission, land trusts, and, and state and federal conservation agencies. Um, we've added to the uh, exchange standards um, some additional incentives for use of transfer development rights. Um, these will probably be controversial given our last discussion. <laughs> 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 um, but this is on, I'm sorry, they're on page numbers, but it's on the, the table of exchange standards, table one. Um, some of the similar types of issues, uh, reduction in front edge, increase in building height, and, and reduction in parking requirements. Um, we have added some details on the issue of cash contributions in lieu of transfer of development rights. This is on um, find this section here. Again, no page numbers, but nine, section 9.397, there's a section titled Alternative Method of TDR Transactions, which basically allows a project proponent to make a cash contribution instead of doing transfer of development rights with a farmer. You make a cash contribution to the town, and then the town in turn uses that money to purchase development rights. This is a, an option that actually is probably the way that the ordinance would by law work most frequently um, given our experience in other towns. Um, the town of Hadley has, has used TDR very successfully and has um, preserved I think over 300 acres of farmland now with their TDR ordinance and, they, and all of the protections have been through this cash transaction method. <laughs> so it, we're just, we've just added some language that um, makes it more clear how that amount of cash um, uh, transaction should be calculated. So it's basically the number of acres um, times the average cost for an uh, agricultural preservation restriction in, in Hampshire County over the last three years is sort of the, the mechanism for calculating how much of a cash contribution um, would be needed. Then we added um, a section 9.399 on the banking of development rights, which basically says that you can purchase development rights and you can hold on to them. You don't have to use them immediately um, if you're a project proponent or a developer, and that um, you don't actually have to apply for a special permit until such time as you want to use those development rights. So this was an, another way to try to encourage the um, bylaw to be used and make it more flexible. And then uh, the last change is on um, the traditional neighborhood development standards section. Uh, we put in some street standards, uh, which would be 
um, part of the subdivision regulations, um, just laying out more specific dimensional standards for, for streets uh, that would be um, included in a traditional neighborhood development. And then last, last but not least, we had some map changes which are reflected um, on the map behind you. Um, most of the changes we made were just to update the map and to show um, existing protective lands. Um, we added or deleted individual parcels from the sending and receiving area based on some of them got developed since we last um, did this. Uh, some of them were protected. Um, and we added a new receiving area in the town center, which is shown in the, I think it's the crosshatcher um, area. So those are the main changes. And again, as was said at the outset, the purpose of doing all this is to try to get folks to actually use the ordinance to make it more functional, more usable. You have not had any takers, apparently, to this point, right, for this ordinance. And um, that's unfortunate, again, just to use Hadley as the example, because they've been kind of the success story. They've had a fairly good number of commercial development projects um, in Hadley that have, um, have used the TDR ordinance um, and have made cash contributions as part of that process. Those, in turn, were, were used um, to protect lands. And, and in Hadley's case, they used the, the cash contributions to leverage state APR dollars. So they actually got a kind of a 10 to 1 return on their money. They, they only had to put up 10% of, of the money for APRs locally. 90% came from the state. So they were able to preserve a lot of farmland as a result. So, you know, we'd love to see you be able to use your ordinance in the same way and, and to have some success with it. Um, so that was the process that has been gone through to try to work out the, the details uh, and any kinks in, in the ordinance, make it more useful. So, just wanted to bring you up to date on that. Um, any, any questions? or? Mm -hmm. okay. When we first started this at you know, first thing, we did have quite a few, well, there were three or four landowners in that that came to a couple of the meetings right. and, and showed a lot of interest, and we thought this would be a big bang thing, and then all of a sudden it sort of fizzled. Right. And to this day, I can't figure out why, because... No. You know, between Gall and Boyle and that, they were really interested in it. That's true. And we kind of kind of kind yeah, of yeah, kind of kind of sort of, so it may put be a kinker into it. A good time to yeah. be ready for the next upswing. Hopefully. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Okay, Chris. thank you all. Thank you. Chris? Can I work at um, perhaps the Council How do you spell your name? Or Chris? Uh, C-H-R-I-S. Okay. C-H-R-T-I-S. Oh, yeah, Chris Curtis. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Right. Just right. checking. Oh, no. <laughs> no K's or... Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. okay. thanks. It makes it all wrong. Yeah, it has. Yeah, a little more... Uh, thank you. Site plan approval. So you're proposing a tattoo salon at 36 Union Street. Yes, tattoo studio and art gallery. Studio, sorry. It's fine, but it just sounds better when you say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I looked over the criteria, and I'm, I think that the location would be perfect. Um, and I still want to need approval from the planning board to open up. It's a different use than uh, the restaurant. And, uh, mm -hmm. So it requires a site plan approval from the board. How many um, customers or clients do you anticipate in business at one time? That I'm in business at one time? Um, maybe just you'd be the only artist working yeah. there? Mm -hmm. 
at first um, until I can establish myself. And then possibly having guest artists come in, which it would only be one other artist. So at maximum, through, I'm, I'm looking at one client being worked on at a time. And you know, possibly one or two, you know, maybe three people in the studio you know, making appointments, looking around the artwork. So they, I can't see that the traffic flow is going to be any any more of an impact with that business than it was with the, <coughs> was with the restaurant. <coughs> You're not going to change any, anything in the exterior of the building. Just just going to be uh, whatever you build on is going to be all on the all interior. The inside, yeah. Other than maybe a sign displaying you know where the parking is, so that's clearly visible, and then the sign out front of the shop putting the logo on there, but. Um, I, I thought about maybe, um, and I don't know how to go about doing this, but um, getting uh, a mural, a mural, maybe approved for that that side of the building. It's um, the landowner. Okay. Yeah. The um, owner. Something that had to do with like, the landscape. I love the landscape. I think it's beautiful here. You know, moving, relocating from from Ohio. Ohio. Hmm. So I, I uh, item I uh, talks about having your trees trimmed. I mean, I don't have an issue with that, except I think that they're city trees, so I, I don't know how that works. I, yeah, that was, I was just taking notes for myself, actually. <laughs> I say, okay. Um, but uh, looking at it from um, coming up, um, Union from the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, you can't really see the sign because of the trees there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and there's two of them. So even getting it approved to trim one side would be really kind of pointless. But you can see it coming down from like the Northampton sign. You yeah. can see the sign clearly. So I, I think that's been an issue along Cod Street just in general. Right. Like a, a blade sign would work better than a face in a facade sign. Right. You know, because then you see it coming from wherever you go. I mean, that was. How some people, some uh, businesses along there and yeah. dealt with that. I believe that's what it is. It's a, uh, it's jutting out from the. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. still. Well, I mean, the trees, huh? Well, I the business, you know, I, I where we're right. Thirty six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thrive on on word of mouth and you know, so repeat business. So, mm -hmm. but the the trees would definitely be the purview of the tree warden. And, yeah. Yeah, they're young yeah, trees. I mean, they're just going to get bigger. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just ask any feet were about the tree. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not going to that. Yeah. Are there any other questions? This is one of those, it'd be great if it was just an administrative approval. Right, yeah, yeah. It seems silly to have to come before the board, but that's the way we're going. It's out of curiosity. You guys don't do uh, uh, your rings and stuff like that, though? Or? No, piercing is, is dying out. Um, that right? I've never really been into it, like the heavy modifications. Yeah. Like that. It's really, I'm more about uh, the artwork. Yeah. Um, and the tattooing um, has undergone a huge revolution. Um, there are more fine artists involved now. So, yeah. And that's kind of my dream is to have a, a gallery that would have oil painting and, and sculptures and stuff as well. So body art. You think about getting a piercing here? <laughs> 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 well, I don't so. <laughs> Just that full sleeve, right? <laughs> the full yeah, sleeve. I've never had a tattoo, so I thought about it a few times. But. Well, I couldn't tell. I'm that sure looks out. <laughs> Pretty plain, huh? Maybe I won't go someday. Maybe I won't get a contact. I'm going to get a I'm going to get a motion to approve. I'll second. Third. Okay, the motion is made and seconded. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? You know, it's Thank you, John. Still so uh, copy of the decision uh, filed with the uh, city, clerk. city clerk, and uh, there's an appeal process after that. But just uh, 20 days after after the date that it's filed, and uh, work on getting that 
um, probably within the next week, so within seven to ten days. I, I'm trying to get shorter time frames so that people get them faster. So, <laughs> okay, that's fine. Awesome. It'd be kind of cool if, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's done, but uh, they could put something up here for like you know somebody get a tattoo. They actually go and watch it being done. I've never seen a tattoo created. You know, yeah. I mean, to me that really interests me. Well, well there's two ways you can go about doing that. <laughs> 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 I actually have uh, several people in line uh, waiting for me. So well, I see it on TV. I mean, you know, the guys are in there to cry. So, you know, man. You're more than welcome to come down and watch me. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> I think we should well, go get Matthew Slane and Wood. See, Harry and I will get, you know, maybe we'll get the incentive to get a tattoo. It's just where you want to have it. Yeah, I guess the it's magic one of my boy. It's awesome. what you want, too, yeah. 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 Or like if someone got to play golf with it, you know, all of a sudden a show, but I didn't want to play so that'd be great. Yeah. I get tortured as it is. Yeah. 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 This was just a discussion. Yeah. 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 Take care. Yeah. Good luck. Have a good night. You too. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Any other business before the flying bird? Mm, no. That's your motion to um, move towards our second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um,